You got a problem, you don't know what to do. Your dreams are strange, and you're seeing things too. The world is full of mystery. Life's more than you can see. You can ask pomegranate. You can ask pomegranate. She's a priestess. What I want to talk to you today about uh, before we get to the questions are, this seems very intense that the world has come to a place of quiet as much as it can with this maximum population of humans that we've ever had on planet at the same time we have learned that these soft bodies are delicate and that these delicate bodies hello need to be careful welcome to ask pomegranate that when the earth demands that of us what happens is we notice that we are in fact connected and we for the most part learn to stop and we can stop isn't that a miracle Isn't it a miracle to notice that we can stop and that we can say we care about each other? Because essentially that's the strongest message that I'm picking up from this quarantine. And um, so then we have to say magically, because that's my job, that's my lane, it's what's going on in the magical world. I'm not a, I'm not supposed to talk to you about the political world (laughs) as much as I am supposed to talk to you about the magical world magically what does this mean and it's a very fascinating thing that's happened from a magical standpoint and i like to when i'm thinking about magic or i like to think of shifting perspectives from the at the the three realms so the three realms are the underworld realm which is the mysterious world of the deep well of mystery the middle world which is where you and i are in our homes going what and also i gotta homeschool i feel for you people who have to homeschool i am not currently raising children and then the other realm and that's the where one where we notice the the air the water the fire the earth and the and the food and then we notice we notice that we have functioning and connection connection to actual physical reality that's middle world stuff and the Um, celestial realms or the upper world which is where we get the picture of um, what's going on from the magical realms of all things are well and we all can't you know the celestial realm is the place we go to when we die and that's sort of the realm of the angels and it's very very sweet And so those people always have a very sweet, optimistic worldview of things. And you'll get very optimistic worldviews, very non-detail oriented information and all this like love and joy and heart and heart and love and joy. And sometimes we call people who only talk to that realm, uh, white lighters or something. Uh, so in the middle world, you're going to have more of the details, the nitty gritties, the political issues, the what's going on and what's happening with the police and what's happening to oppression and what's happening with what's happening with the current administration and how are we relating to one another and you screwed this up and I got this right and uh, get someone just give me a hug, you know, that kind of like, how, and what's for dinner, that kind of nitty gritty, everything is in the moment and time based. And from below, we'll see the deep, the deep mysteries of change. And we can only, it's more of a feeling space. There's less words. There's less, there's less, um, you know, being, well, immediately I lose words as soon as I get tap into it. I'm like, there's less words and there's nothing else to say about that here. Let me send you a picture with my mind. You go down there and you get into the slow, there's still time. There's slow turning of the giant wheels of the cosmos. And um, that has direct information about being manifest that are relevant to us, but in much longer time period, like eons or beyond eons. So I like to look at things from all three perspectives and um, see what we can gather. And my main job, 
my personal main job as a priestess and a mystic is to give you the report from both the celestial and the underworld realms and then give you some tips on how to handle those people. <laughs> when you're the one who's manifest, I mean, after all, we're the ones on the ground. We're the ones dealing with this stuff and like, yeah, sure, to the celestial realms, what we're doing is all a hologram and all a dream and not really super real and kind of like almost just like a TV show, right? But to us, it's very real. We're really going through it and it's really meaningful to us. So it's all about kind of reconciling that complexity. And after all, we're the brave ones who came to the earth and decided to live. And, let, and we all decided to agree to be here now. We're all here now for this moment. Uh, whatever year you're in, I'm in 2020. This is, you came here for this right now. Uh, so let's think about these three realms. And as I talk to the spirit people about the three realms, what I get from the celestial realms is Pay attention to the crown on your head. Coronavirus means crown. Pay attention to, to the way that you are sovereign unto yourself. The encouragement from the celestial beings is be true to yourself. Now is the time to know who you are and to be as much yourself as you can be. So as this phenomenal experience happens, because you can't compare this period to any other time. And we, and they tell me, yes, you'll have probably have another period like this, uh, where things get closed down again sometime in your lifetime. Um, but as we move from the world before, the quarantine, essentially, as we move from that world into the world that we will emerge into, and it might look real similar to you, but it's not going to be similar. It's, it's going to be totally different because we're at a crossroads. And as at the crossroads, we're at the in-between place. They say to me, it's a gate. You're in between. You have several months of in-betweenness. And as we move from one to the other, we let go. This is can be quite painful. We let go of things that don't let you be you. And that might be stuff you love and you liked and you wanted to hold on to or your ego or thoughts about who you would be in the future or understandings about who you might be but didn't quite fit you. But it might be people too and it might be any number of things it might be actually work. Work is very big in this gate. How you change your work life is really big because we're not working, most of us. So you move through this gate and you go out, will go out into another world. And in this moment, it's important for us to allow ourselves to have dreams. And not to be perfectionistic about those dreams, but just allow ourselves to have the wild dream of the future. We have to do that without expectation that it's a fairy tale where we'll have a dream, we'll step out of this gate, the dream will be there. That's not the way things work on planet Earth. Things on planet Earth like to change and they like to have time to reconfigure. But if you allow patience what in your lifetime would be a dream come true for you? Be, be a little selfish, honey. Be a little selfish. For you, what is the dream you have for you? Because when you dream for yourself, you dream for humanity. When you dream for yourself, you dream for the other red-blooded beings, the animal people. You're an animal person. When you dream for yourself, you dream for the living blood of the earth for the green beings 
You dream the dream of the earth's heart itself. Through you, the dream comes. So we're in the gate between, and it's time to dream. That's This is the celestial people talking. This is paying attention to the crown. <laughs> this is a, the crown. Imagine that you have a magical crown on, and it belongs to everyone has one. And it's each one is unique and each crown allows others to have significance, um, to signify who you are and what your powers are because your powers are unique. They come out of literally your power is uniqueness. Okay. What I mean by that is your uniqueness is your power. So however you are specifically as a human being, you are specifically, ex and that's going to be uncomfortable for some people. Um, however, you are unique. That's in fact your power. And the more you can accept that uniqueness and hone in on it and let it sing through, the more your crown shines, the more you manifest into the world. So that's the message from the celestial realm about this, about this here virus. They're not worried, but they're never worried, are they? I mean, <laughs> you know, it's all like, oh, you know, with those guys, which I love. I mean, I love to go float up on there and talk to them and get their perspective and then think about how I'm going to pay my mortgage, right? So that's the celestial realm. Cool. How long am I going on for? Too long? That's for almost 15 minutes. Oh, just on the celestial realm? Yep. Okay. And the message for the middle world, when we come to the middle world to, to listen, we want to listen to the elementals so we can listen to the world by perceiving and becoming aware of the way the elements move through our own bodies. And I can tell you the messages I'm getting y'all, but you got to listen to the ones that you're getting, um, too, which of course trump anything I say, because your direct line to your spiritual life is what's important, but we just can simply go around to the different parts of us and just notice uh, those different parts and try to get not what our bodies are telling us, but what the bigger spirit moving through us are telling us. Do you see the difference? So in other words, when I go to air, I don't go, what am I thinking um, for to receive the messages? I go, what is air telling me? Which, cause you know, I mean, I don't know about your brain, but my brain's got a lot of stuff programmed in it that is not useful, <laughs> you know, because of oppression. So uh, oppression is has been programmed into my brain. And as much as I've tried to deprogram it, it's still in there. So I don't just go, hey, brain, what are you thinking? And then believe that. I say, what is air telling me? And I noticed that air speaks to me not through necessarily the first place, which is my brain but through my lungs. So I breathe in and this coronavirus, you might notice, is all about your lungs. I'm fairly sure I've had it and recovered from it, but it's a virus that comes into the heart. It's a virus that comes to the heart through the air, through the lungs, and it brings our attention to the heart. And the heart and the air are what it's working on. And I actually... I know it's killing people and that's real and I don't mind people that people are, are dying because I think death is a very lovely thing. But what I don't like is people dying and needlessly before when they really are prepared for it and through ridiculousness um, of government actions. That's not okay. But what the virus is doing is as we talk to the virus itself, not all of the politics and the uh, around it, but the actual virus itself, the virus itself comes into our bodies and it comes, pay attention to your heart, pay attention to your lungs, 
pay attention to what needs to change in your heart. And it asks you to get slow and quiet. It asks you to be home. It asks you to be home in your body. Breathe in and be home in your body. And when we listen to our bodies, uh, we listen to the earth because the earth is our body. You know, literally the, the earth said, I'll make something for you to go into. It's a vessel. Come on, spirit, come on down. So we're in relationship to the earth and we're in relationship to the air. And the earth says rest. The earth says slow. The earth says, oh, you darling, busy, busy, busy people. Can you please just stop? I know there's a lot of you. Can you please just slow? So allow yourself to slow. That's what my body is telling me. The air is telling me to open my heart and to pay attention to my breath. And breath is the most regulating thing that you can pay attention to. Breath regulates us. And one of the things that the middle world is asking me to learn about and teach is the importance of calm and regulation. Because there is not a priestess who is useful if she ain't calm. you got to be calm. You've got to learn to regulate. Breath is one of the most important ways to do that. And I've, I'm going to send out a little tiny little snippet um, uh, of just breathing techniques that will be available for free on my site that I hope you use. I'm not going to do it now, but I'll, I'll send it out. And I've learned these techniques many different years and I've been healed by them. So breath. So then we have fire. Notice your body is warm. Is your body warm? It's probably warm if you're still alive. <laughs> okay. You might, you might feel cold when you're housed, but you're warm. And that's a weird thing. Like beings, things that emanate heat on this planet are not many things. Like really we're one of the weirdest things we emanate heat us animals so that's fire honey that's fire coming through and that's warming you and that's that synapsis so one of the things with fire is again there are times when our fire needs to calm and needs to bank or it needs to be revved up and used and so that's the other side does your body need to move does your body need to move as a way to calm you? Does it need to rest as a way to calm you? Because at this moment, and really at all moments, calm is the, is the way. First we calm before we do magic. That's called grounding. First we calm. Grounding is a form of noticing that you're made up of these elements. And water is the next one. What is the water offering my body? The water is offering my body the ocean. You know, we come from the ocean. Our blood is almost as salty as the ocean. We're little bags of ocean walking around. So what is the water offering me? And the water often offers us uh, acceptance of our emotional state. So here you are in the middle world, however you feel, and that's an emotions, emotions are real simple at their heart it's sadness do you feel sad accepting that don't feel the need to run away from your sadness this is sad i i can can't tell you why i feel sad sometimes i'm just bursting out in tears for no reason sometimes it's tears of joy and sometimes it's tears of sadness anger that's sort of a, an advanced emotion that we have after we've had the other ones. But when we, by the time we get to anger, we need to set a boundary. Happiness. What can you celebrate? What are the micro expressions of joy? Micro celebrations. What can you celebrate? Fear. Am I safe in this moment? Look around you. Check in. Are you safe in this moment? You might be feeling afraid, but in fact, that's your brain running that story. So... Are you safe in this moment? Are you physically, honey, physically? That's what I want to talk about. 
safe in this moment? That's what's important to ask. And if not, make a change immediately. And if, if you are in this moment physically safe, not five minutes from now, but right now, let yourself breathe in calm. I'm trying to rem- remember the other <laughs> emotions. Uh, you might be feeling disgusted. That means there is change for you to make in the future about what you're feeling disgusted about. I imagine you might be feeling disgusted about political things. These are very real. Uh, disgust is a very powerful thing saying, uh-uh, no, not to this. No, I'm not having this. Uh, is it safe for me or is it poisonous? Shock is a very likely thing. This is a very shocking thing when we've lived our whole lives in a, in a busy bee co- world. Be in shock. That's a, that's a space of in-betweenness. Allowing yourself shock is allowing yourself time to integrate. That's what the middle world is asking us to do, to take in, to slow, and to notice, and to be in our bodies. Mostly, it's asking us to cultivate calm. And I encourage you to calm yourself and help others stay calm. And if you, they won't help, let take your help, then I encourage you to let them be upset and not get wrapped up in their stuff. Because we're not useful at big, magical, powerful moments if we're not calm. We have to be calm to make good decisions, okay? Now let us go into the underworld and see if I can have any words about it when I get there. <laughs> Because when we look at things from the underworld, we see the great turnings. And these are the spiral turnings of times and planets and stars. And these take a long time. And I want to remind you that when we're talking about the planet, a lot of times we like to get upset about it. And there's no reason for you not to get upset about it. Go in, You're in the middle world. You're upset about the ecosystems. You're upset about um, global catastrophe, also known as global warming, but it's really a global catastrophe. These are all reasonable things. Let yourself have that experience and make decisions about what you want to do about that. But when we go into the underworld, we have to listen to the planet itself. And the planet is old. I mean, let's talk about this girl. She used to be a dust cloud of gases. She's been there. <laughs> there was one time, I don't know if I ever told you all about this, but there was one time on the planet Earth when it rained every day, all day, for one million years. <laughs> true these are true facts so having grown us the planet has grown us the humans and we belong to her we are her she's not mad and the ecosystems dying are curious to the planet now when you raise your consciousness up and you go into the middle world and you look at the ecosystems dying you're like oh my god oh my god panic panic this is upsetting that's fine but when we go into the underworld and we listen to the deep beings that are old they're like this is just another day and it's not even a very long one y'all because from the point of view from of the planet's life i think our existence is the equivalent to a long kiss this is what my lover tells me (laughs) so uh and i you know i take their word for it um so we're just a long kiss in the existence of the planet and after that we're gone I feel like as I go into the underworld and I talk to it about what's going on, uh, a great deal of interest in keeping us from self-destructing because we're quite interesting. And I'm talking about the humans. We're quite interesting to these old ones. So what I feel in the underworld is a great deal of support. And this is part of what the great turning of slowness and turning is being offered to us from the underworld. We're getting an offering of slowing, offering of changing our perspective, our, 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 our um, perspective of time into a more underworld perspective where things are much slower. And so if you can, the underworld has invited us to breathe and fall into the earth, which might also be known as your couch, and to fall into that slowing down consciousness, allowing ourselves to become 
a part of the slowness and the heartbeat that is the center of this planet and slow turning of the spheres. Got to get out of the underworld before I put myself into trance. So that's the, the three perspectives I have as a mystic. And if it's helpful to you in whatever perspective you're working on, because there's so many people out there working, working, working on many different um, levels. They're working against oppression. They're working against racism. They're working. F they're working for, which means they're working for freedom, and they're working for um, equality, and they're working for the re florid re not the word fluoridation that's the wrong word but you know when things come back and get all vital again with the growing living things and i applaud you all thank you so much for doing your thing and hopefully we can this is helpful to you to hear a little bit or you can perceive in your own way what you're hearing from the three realms the three magical realms that are running through your body because remember you are grounded by your spirit body into the underworld. Uh, the Hindu people call these chakras and they believe that you have seven and I see them, seven chakras that go into the underworld. You have seven chakras that live in the middle world. And then you have seven chakras that reach up into the celestial realms. So you belong in all three, you own all three. And from that place, from the crown, which goes into the celestial realm, that's the crown of manifestation from the heart of the dreams and the inspirations. That's your heart in your body that op can open and be winged and allow the dreams to come through as we enter into this new world. And listen, if you're listening to this at another time, don't worry about it. This is always true. We are always entering into a new world. Your heart opening and allowing the breath to come in and for your dreams to reveal themselves to you so you can know your uniqueness because that's what's important. And for the underworld, the heartbeat of the joy of the Mother Earth, honey, move up through that slow system of spiraling power into your body to empower you and let your heart open. And those three realms together meet in you. And that's why you're so cool. You're really cool because all three realms are meeting in you. And everything you do, if you can stay calm, everything you do from that place, from that calm, open-hearted, crowned, grounded place, that unique place that is you, is magical power. And that's what you have. To leave a question for me, Dial 520-222-9922. 520-222-9922. Hey, Tom, this is Jamie in Portland. I'm calling because my son has a relationship with his shadow, which I now understand to be his death after your uh, workshop at the conference this year. And I think it's awesome and I want to um, learn more skills about magical parenting and what are some things to say or not say um, besides just acknowledging and being curious and so anything you want to say about uh, kids and their shadow in particular or magical parenting in general would be great. Thanks so much. Bye-bye. Thanks for that question, Jamie. Yeah, children, I, um, there's three things that I like to start with children because I don't, there's a totally different kind of training that I do for people who are 24 and older because those people have frontal lobes and can self-regulate and, uh, that there's different things that I train people who are 24 years and under and there are three and you can train older people in this too, but it's, it's really useful to them. So first I like to help children re find a relationship, a magical relationship to other beings. And that could be, you know, other beings like the gnomes or the trees or the rocks or death or whatever it may be. 
so that they can build those relationships and understand that they can talk to, listen to those beings and have that kind of complex, uh, connected relationship. Because I think a lot of people feel disconnected because they don't know how to talk to all these different realms. And that leaves a real empty feeling when you when you think of a tree as an object rather than a living being, when you can't talk to the crows, you you feel a little disconnected. So that's one relationships, building relationships. And I'll give you a tip for how to do that. The other one is discernment. Is this good for me? Is this relationship with this being for me? Am I for them? Because it has to go both ways. And so learning how to discern can be a really fun thing. And then learning how to cast magical protection is a really fun thing. And then just working your own energy field um, throughout all of them. So the first one, which is relational, uh, you can just play simple games. Now, I will tell you, if you have access to anything that swings, like a hammock or a swing itself or a rocking chair, if you put a child in that swinging motion, it allows them to naturally just kind of get a little tranced out and they're, they'll just fall into it real, real simply. And, um, it's a good place. Like a park and a swing is a good place to do this. If you don't have a backyard, I happen to be very privileged to have a backyard and a hammock. So we'll often get in that and we start talking to the tree. So one game you could play is what does the tree think? And we just go to the tree, pick a really tree that you like. And we, and I say, close your eyes and breathe in. And can you feel, because trees emanate energy. So you could just say, can you feel the energy of the tree? How does it feel in your body? Stay somatic, stay in the body with children. Can, and then the child will tell you, it feels whatever a tree, that tree feels. And then you can say, are there any pictures in your head that the tree is talking to you in? Or does the tree talk to you through your lungs? Or does the tree talk to you through smells? How does the tree feel? How, what does the tree offer? What does the tree want? And so just asking these simple questions immediately before you get very far in, the child will be off telling you a million different things. And you can say, look at that cloud up there and do the same thing with the clouds. And then the classic, what shape is the cloud making? Um, so things like that, where you're just asking them to see, feel, hear, taste, using the senses to discuss with the tree. And then they'll just get, they'll, they'll get excited because suddenly it's amazing. So that's one um, discernment. We, we teach the child that gut feeling. We go into the body, we go into the gut feeling, and we say, what does yes feel like? What does no feel like? What does maybe feel like? And then you go towards, um, you can use a series of plants, or you can go out within, just notice people, Be when you're allowed to go out and be with people, and just notice like when you see that person, what do you feel? Do you feel a yes, no, maybe? And then this is just giving them the authority to know when their body reports to them a no, that they are allowed to follow that no. And that it, it's absolutely within their power to not have to engage with anybody they get a no about. And it's in their power to learn how to make an offering of connection uh, from that feeling of yes. So that's a real simple thing you can do. And then um, I, for protection magic, I like to teach them about their aura. I like to teach them about the energy field that they emanate. Cause like, you know, we're emanating energy, literally heat. And at the edge of that heat, when it dissipates, that's where you'll find the edge of your aura. And you can push that out bigger if you want to. So I would just like, play a game of swinging arms to find, um, to be able to find the edges of that aura and just swinging arms. See, that's the edge of you. I'm swinging my arms. I'm bumping the mic, uh, <laughs> while I do this. And we just, we just do that until you feel like you're in a big balloon. And that's sort of like casting a magical circle just by using your own presence in the world. Make sure you get the back, 
make sure you do above, make sure you do below so that they get that whole sphere experience. And then if you have a couple of kids around or you and a kid, you can play or a bumper cars where you notice that you're a big balloon and you walk up kind of high eyes, half mast, and you walk up to that person and you're like, when you feel their energy, you bounce off of them like you're a balloon. If you want to go further with this, you can go into changing the shape of the balloon. You can say it's fluffy or it's gritty or it's spiky or um, slick or it's real or you bring it close in. That balloon is really close in. We do that when we're in clouds, crowds, we bring our, our balloon close in or it takes up all the whole house. And these, this is a fun game. And, it, and from that, you can teach them to go further and to ground, breathe into the earth and be like a tree and pull the energy up from the ground and then teach them how to cast a circle and how to take a circle down, which is just, you know, again, using your finger to say, oh, I'm now in a circle that I have designated as safe. There's that place and there's this place. You got to remind them to take it down. And th because, you know, there's lots of times in life when you just need a quick circle up. And if you teach your child how to do that, um, when they get in tough spots, that's a really good, powerful tool rather than engaging in some kind of uh, problem. They can just whip up a circle and then see what they need to do next first before anything else happens. So those are some fun games for you and your delightful child. Thanks, Jamie. Five two zero two 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 ninety nine twenty two ninety nine twenty two. I want to tell you about a book called Black Imagination, written by or curated by Natasha Marin. She's the gal behind Saul TV on Facebook, which is why I'm back making podcasts right now. And this episode of Ask Pomegranate will be on Saul TV on Facebook. She's also the gal that started the website Reparations, which can be found at reparations.me. And that's a place you, if you have are a person of color or are black and have a need, you can post it. And if you're identifying as white or experiencing privilege, you can go and meet those needs. It's such a brilliant idea. So go to Amazon or Powell's.com and buy the book, Black Imagination. You will be happy. Thank you, Natasha. You can ask pomegranate. You can ask Pomegranate. Hi, Pomegranate. Brittany here, residing in our lovely Portland. And I've got more of a personal question for you. As a witch and a psychic, how do I stop being afraid that I'm going insane? I identify as a weirdo, a witch, a seer, an empath. I have priestess training and energetic training, and more and more I know that this magical path is my life's purpose. As an odd kid who talked to trees and spirits and counseled adults, I think I've always known. Uh, but I also have a lot of mental illness in my family, including my brother and protector, who also talked with spirits, uh, but he was diagnosed schizophrenic, and I watched that just destroy him to the point where he died from an overdose. So I'm working with this intense fear of insanity and also this protective nature, this hiding of myself and my ability, because I've seen it go so badly. <laughs> Am I just a crazy person using my insanity to justify becoming more insane? And I'd like to fully dive in to being a witch, but part of me wonders, is this the edge of insanity? 
And if I dive, will I be rightfully institutionalized in five years? Thank you. All that you do. Thanks, Brittany. I appreciate that question. It's uh, very vulnerable, and I think it's a really important question. I want to kind of break it up a little bit into two parts. And the first part I want to talk about is growing up with mental illness and people with mental illness in your family. And the second part I want to talk about is, is it crazy to be a mystic? Essentially, that's what you're asking. Um, <clears throat> and this is, that's a question that comes up for a lot of people and uh, whenever they have mystic abilities. So it's important to talk about. Having grown up in a family like the one you're describing, the first thing I would want to pause and think about is what I would ask myself if I were you is, do I have PTSD? Do I have post-traumatic stress disorder? And there's that a possibility and the other possibility, there's many possibilities, but another possibility is that you have in fact, complex post-traumatic stress disorder. So I also have um, a brother who did an over, had an overdose and uh, died as a result of it. So I know about that trauma. And <clears throat> that's more when a single incident happens, you get post-traumatic stress disorder. When you are a child and you're in an environment that is dysregulated, because of things, rageaholism or alcoholism or one of the many clusters in the psychology realm. There's clusters you might want to go read about about them. Cluster A, cluster B, and plus cluster C. So you can start to understand what is mental illness, what does it look like, and what are the behaviors involved with it. Um, that might just help you assess yourself a little bit. But when you, when, when we're raised that way, we have, we might have uh, CPTSD and that means we got to calm, that means our bodies are not calm and that our bodies think that we're um, about to be attacked, essentially. It means what they're realizing now is that your vagus nerve, your sympathetic vagus nerve, which is one part of your electrical system, your nerve system has been turned on chronically and so it just sort of stays turned on and we can't feel uh we cannot navigate our way to feeling calm and <clears throat> that's harsh and when that happens often you will develop coping mechanisms that are interesting, like becoming more psychic. So whatever little bit of psychic you had before, when we're in trauma as a way to kind of be psychically hyper vigilant and monitor the situation and try to make good choices, which works, we tend to be more psychic. So trauma, in other words, traumatized people, especially children, are often psychic. And I find this in my practice a lot. Um, because you get you just get people who've been traumatized and they're dysregulated as a result of it, but they're also psychic. And my job is to help people handle their psychic ability. So the first thing I would do if I were you is I would seek seek out some information about that um, when the vagus nerve is so sympathetic vagus nerve is activated, we go into flight or fight or um, freeze, and that actually turns out can be, can be turned off. It's actually possible to turn that off through a series of breathing exercises. I'm going to share some, but there's other places you can go to look up into that. Um, I'm going to share them online. So that's where I'd start. I'd start with breathing and, and, and paying attention to that electrical impulse to notice that I'm not safe. And if you have mental illness on top of that, uh, that can, we can seek treatment for that. And I would just go and get treatment. I would go and ask someone, I would go to my best friend who was the wisest person I knew. I would go to the wisest person I know, who the calmest person I know. And I would say, do you think I have any of these mental illnesses? 
And then I would go seek out a counselor because there's lots of counselors that are very mystic and understand. When you call a counselor, just say, look, I'm a psychic. Can you handle that? (laughs) And if they're like, well, dear, no, that's not a real thing. Then call another one. Um, Because there's lots of psychic who psychic counselors now. In other words, therapists who are also psychic. So, and can handle it. So go find out if you're worried about it. Why not ask the questions, research and find out. But I'm going to give you this little pearl of wisdom that my therapist gave to me, uh, which was when I was worried, he said to me, but Pom, you know who you are. And I want to say to you, Brittany, Brittany, you know who you are. You know your character flaws and you know your strengths and you know the truth of what you perceive. So I just want you to take that in because somewhere inside your body, you know, the answer to, I can't, I don't know you, so I can't answer for you. Are you mentally ill or not? But you know, inside of you. And I'll say for the record, um, all kinds of different people hear voices. The question you have to ask yourself is not, do I hear voices, but are those voices helpful? So as a priestess, if a voice that comes to me, now I've got lots of filters, but if, a, if it gets through the filters, if a voice comes to me and it's not helpful, that it's, it's demanding or it's cranky or it doesn't support me or it says mean things to me or gives me dire warnings that scare me, I don't listen to it. I'm discerning. I only listen to voices that are kind, helpful, encouraging, supportive, and give me good direction that helps me stay regulated and calm. And when you are schizophrenic, you don't have the the ability, I think, to necessarily stop those voices. So that's sort of the difference between hearing a voice and being a mystic. Um, So if your voices aren't uh, that are coming through are not good, you can work on that and you say you're trained. So, so that's the, so that's the context I would give you. And then the second half of your question we want to know is being a mystic, the equivalent of being insane. And what I will say to that is it's a form of misogyny to think that mysticism is insanity. Uh, We have a right, you have a right, and I have a right to mystery. It's one of the birthrights. You have a right to make inquiries into the unknown and to perceive what's there. And we don't, when we're working mystically, we don't just like buy everything we get. One of the things that's really important when we get psychic information is to notice, does it make you feel something uh, emotional like fear or anger or something like that? Are you feeling, when you get the information, do you then feel reactive? That's a warning sign that that information is not useful because psychic information, when it comes to us, it comes in a very calm way. The reason it comes in a calm way is because usually it comes from the underworld in which all great turnings of time are so slow that we don't have, there's no use in being reactive or it comes from the celestial realms in which Everything is so interesting and valuable and worthwhile and helping us grow. So it's all good, right? It's all manner of things are well. It's the celestial realm motto. So when it comes to us, we, we will just know it as a truth as a po- and feel calm about it. Um, and not have a long hyper reaction to it. And then we also might get information about what we can do about that. And though that those actions will be healing actions. So when you feel the need to take an action, just check, like, do I, would I want this coming back to me three times? Because 
it's going to come back to you three times. I know that seems interesting that that might be true, but also 10 times might come back to you. So when you're taking an action, um, you can take it, you need to take it with compassion for whatever you're putting that action on. So that that's just about being a little bit careful, but you have a right to mystery, honey. You, people need you. If you're a mystic, this is the time the mystics are needed. People need to hear the voice of the mystics as they're having their deep, profound relationship to the celestial and the underworld realms, the plant realm. Uh, it, it speaks to us. I mean, whatever kind of psychic you are, if you talk to the dead, whoever it is, we, or if you're dealing with the unquiet dead, like I am right now, there's a lot of action with the unquiet dead out there right now, people. What's going on? Why are they all wanting to cross over suddenly? That's a little aside. Um, but we need you, honey. We need you to be a mystic and we need your voice and people need it. And remember, the word is healing. So we work, when we work towards being a mystic, we work towards healing. And just check that. Is that healing for you, what you're doing? Because if it's healing for you, it will be healing for others. And I encourage you, my darling, to be free and to not fall into and fall under the, the oppression of uh, misogyny. It's also racist racism because it's very like that white mechanicalized Descartian culture to say that there isn't mystery in the world in the worlds, right? So, you know, don't be perfectionistic. Let yourself make mistakes. Reach into the mystery and channel it through. Work in a group if you need the support because that'll help you check what you're getting. And I just want to remind you, you know who you are. Thanks for that question. You can ask pomegranate, you can ask pomegranate. Hi, pomegranate. My name is Malia, and I'm calling from Portland. And I have been trying to find information about how I can honor that I have a crush on. So there's a specific tree in my neighborhood, a big, beautiful oak tree that must have it must exert power over the neighborhood because it has been saved several times throughout generations. And I was drawn to it immediately when I moved into my neighborhood about three and a half years ago. And I feel like I want to develop a closer relationship with that tree spirit, but I don't know how to go about it. So I've been asking for guidance in dreams and, and, you know, just listening to my intuition when I kind of pose that question out to the ether. But I figured I'd call the big guns and see if you have any uh, experience and insight, as I know that you are very close to the ancient forest spirits of Portland area. So looking forward to any insight you can provide that would help me deepen my relationship with my my neighborhood tree crush. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye. When approaching the tree, make an offering. And the best offering a, tr a tree can use is water. And pour a little water at the roots. Use your manners. Say hello. Give them a little drink. The other one is just to breathe out fully because they are literally the other half of our lungs we're the other half of their lungs. And if you think about the shape of your lungs, it's like a tree. So breathing in their offering and breathing out your offering, it's almost like that conversation of the language, you know, because they're breathing in what we breathe out, etc. The other thing is we have in common is that the trees are also working the three realms very intensively down below, they're in the underworld. They've got all that magical power that we now know about, which is the mycelium, which is the the body of a mushroom. And those those creatures are relating to trees and the roots in the underworld. They're in the middle world through the trunk and then they're, they reach up into the celestial realms with the crown of the tree. So it's almost like we were talking about the beginning of the show. 
they know about those three realms. And, and this is um, probably we got that tree of life grounding from First Nations people of the Americas. But it's hard to tell because we're all connected. So it probably came from everywhere, but it's likely that it was we have it in modern stories from the First Nations people. Um, who knows? I mean, we probably all have it from all cultures. And um, that is a very powerful thing to just go and sit with a tree and then do uh, like a little pretend. This is what we do. We pretend we're trees when we do the tree of life grounding. We just pretend we have roots. We pretend we have crowns. Trees love that stuff. Um, the other thing that was told to me by tree lovers, which is, is that when a tree, when you're attracted to a tree, it's probably because the tree is flirting with you. It's like, come here, talk to me. I got stuff to tell you. I got stuff to give you. And trees are very generous. They're always giving. They're fruiting and they're leafing and they're breathing. I mean, they're just like a font of abundance and generosity and they love to be received. So if you just simply receive, that's a beautiful thing. But, you know, use your imagination to understand what it wants to give you. And there's lots of plant wisdom out there amongst uh, many peoples in many cultures. And the oak tree is just classic. So if you're talking to an oak tree, you're talking about strength and endurance. And there's something about the tree that it wants to lend you that strength, elegance, beauty, beauty, and endurance. It's, uh, I find when I talk to the oaks that they're slower with the way they move their energy and their sap and stuff. It's just, they're a little slower and they're a little sort of like, um, a low bass note of energy, like, oh, you know, whereas when I'm talking to the Doug firs and I'm talking to the cedars, uh, those guys are just fast. <laughs> they're like lightning bolts. They're like, they're moving star energy through them like crazy, like boom, 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 up and down. There's a lot of fast energy and um, they're kind of singing at a higher note and a little more buzzy, like, like that it's very interesting um so you can just talk to them through the way you think and talk and they'll talk to you that way so like just now they talk to me through sound but they'll often talk to me through smell and i think falling in love with a tree you're falling in love with all the trees of that realm of that repair that realm <laughs> i mean neighborhood uh <laughs> so notice what other trees that tree is touching either through the roots or through their leaves. And you can follow a line where they're all connected. And I'll bet that tree might all go all the way to your domicile where you can feel the energy of that tree literally touching you. Check it out. See what happens with that. Um, but I have favorite trees in town that I just have to go stop and say hello to like there's this one birch tree in portland people in portland that's just behind the starbucks on pal and 30 what is that pal and 36 that one if you instead of going back onto pal you turn right there's a incredible birch tree and i'm like can we turn right so i can just say hello to my friend the birch tree go check that tree out anybody in portland that tree is like unbelievably amazingly wonderful and filled with the fae yes it is so if you need a little blue magic from the fae that's a place to go um but i recommend anybody at any time if they ever need to calm and regulate they go and sit with a tree and if you can't sit with it look out your window at it because it's almost as good mm. yeah trees <laughs> that's the show. I want to thank you all for encouraging me over the last couple of years when I couldn't record to come back and record. And I want to encourage you and I want to encourage you to be encouraging, encourage you to be yourselves. And I would encourage you to encourage others because through that power, that's how we heal the world. <laughs>